morning, everybody. I am Sara Pitonet from Trust IT Services, and I'm really pleased and honored to welcome all of you to this Fair Spare 21. 2021 public meeting. The uh, agenda of uh, today will uh, start with uh, an introduction. And if you go to the next slide, please. Yeah, thanks. With uh, an introduction by Ingrid Dillo. Uh, dance and first fair coordinator about the role of the first fair project in the context of the ERISC, the European Open Science Cloud. Uh, Ingrid will be then followed by uh, Joy Davidson from the Digital Curation Center presenting the supporting, uh, how first fair is supporting the rules of participation. And uh, she will be followed by Ilona von Stein, uh, Dance. Uh, talking about fair assessment metrics and certification. Uh, we'll then follow, we'll follow with a Mentimeter interactive uh, session. And uh, then we'll have the first of our two panel sessions uh, with our guest Juan Bicaregui, uh, Patricia Clark, Francoise Genova and Efke Smith. We'll then stop for a short break and then we'll reconvene for a second uh, presentation session uh, where we'll have Elizabeth Newell from SDFC introducing the support training and skills activities of Fair's Fair and Jessica Pallad von Hessen uh, from CSC, uh, the IT Center for Science in Finland, presenting the architecture uh, framework. Uh, we'll then go again for a second Mentimeter interactive session that will uh, open the second panel discussion. Uh, with Isabel Bernal, Etu Makila, uh, David Carr, and Inge van uh, Nieberbrock. Uh, the panel discussions, both of them, uh, will be moderated, but um, questions and interruption from the audience is very much welcome. A, a little bit of logistics, so the presentations that you will see today uh, are presented as recorded videos, but all our speakers and presenters are here and welcome to interact with you during the moderated uh, discussion uh, moments uh, or uh, receiving your questions through the chat that you can use here on Zoom. We kindly ask you to mute yourself uh, while not speaking and we remind presenters to turn the video on while presenting. Next slide, please. So who will you meet today? Uh, we have more than 300 registered participants to the event uh, today and 60%, almost 60% of them come from universities and research performing organizations. Then we have another 50% of research infrastructures and infrastructures representatives followed by another 7% of repository service providers. And then we have industry, uh, we have uh, both SMEs and large enterprises, covert policymakers, and research funding organizations. So we're very, very proud of the interest we gained. And then next slide. And then we are also very uh, proud to uh, say that we have more than 50 countries represented today. So again, thank you all for the interest. And uh, in in, uh, in this event and in first fair, and then I leave I give the floor to Ingrid. As project coordinator, I have the pleasure to start us off today. I am extremely pleased to already see a large number of registrants and among them many familiar names, but also a lot of names that are new to me. So a very warm welcome to all of you. And it's such a pity that we are still not able to meet face to face. But I for one keep hope that maybe the final event of this project will be face to face again. 
My talk today serves as a quick introduction to the project and its place in the European EOSC landscape. Here you see the project Fairs Fair in a nutshell. As you can see, the project comes from a call called Infra EOSC 5. It has a budget of 10 million euro, a duration of three years, and we started in March of 2019, so the project still has a little more than a year to go. In the project, we have six core partners who um, act as work package leads. And next to DANS, these are the European University Association, Trust IT, the Digital Curation Centre, the UKRI, and CSC in Finland. But that is not all. As you can see, in total, we have 22 partners in this project, coming from eight different member states. And they come from different um, stakeholders. We have service providers, for example, repositories in the project. We also have uh, research performing organizations. As you can see, we have uh, a number of universities collaborating in the project. And we also have international organizations like CoData and the Research Data Alliance. The why of the project. This slide shows you the overall aim of Fairs Fair. And um, as you can see, Fair's Fair has a very um, pragmatic approach. We are there to supply practical solutions for the use of the fair data principles that, as you know, are um, quite high level and abstract. And we look for that at the whole research data lifecycle. And within that, we have a focus again on fostering fair data culture and the uptake of good practices in making data fair. Another way of looking at that objective is to say that the project is meant to follow up and also to implement the recommendations from the expert group on fair data um, that produced the report Turning Fair into Reality in 2018. On this slide, you see the different work packages in the project. And as you can see, work package one and work package five, focusing on the project management and on engagement, communication and uptake, are really um, generic and cross-cutting. Work packages two and three focus on fair policies and practices. They have a very broad range of activities, ranging um, from the support of semantic interoperability to the formulation of policy recommendations, for example, for funders and publishers. Work package four, which is one of the larger work packages, concentrates on certification and on support for fair enabling trustworthy digital repositories. But for example, also on developing tools for fair data assessment. Work package six and seven look at training and professionalization in the context of fair. Here we work, for example, on the development of guidelines for higher education institutions to implement fair data competencies in their curricula, and we develop and run data stewardship courses. And as you can see at the bottom of this slide, many of the activities, of course, um, across, uh, cut across more than um, one work package. Here you see an image that I used in the autumn of 2019 when we had our first general assembly of the project. And it shows you the Fair's Fair vessel on the high seas next to the fleet of the so-called 5B projects and the horizontal projects. And it is obvious that this does not even approach the true complexity of the current landscape in which we are active with this project. I think, although this overview may be a little bit duller, it is very much closer to the truth. Here you can see uh, the project on the left-hand side. In the left-hand uh, column, you see um, all the projects coming from uh, that 5B call. So the regional ones, um, the EU Secretariat project and Fair's Fair. In the middle column, you see all the bodies of the EU's governance, 
ranging from the governance board to all uh, the EOSC working groups that have been active over the last two years, and the Infra EOSC 5 cross project collaboration board that brings together all the five projects. Then we also have um, another column completely on the right hand side where you see the more horizontal EOSC related projects and the S3 clusters. And also, of course, many other fair initiatives that popped up not only in Europe, but also in other places around the world. So here you can see that the landscape is very complex. And um, this has to do with the amount of partners and initiatives, but also with the different timings and even still with the evolution of um, concepts and ideas that we're dealing with uh, when we um, try to implement FAIR. We have designed several ways to um, deal with these complexities. First of all, we created the inter internal synchronization force. That force functions as a kind of linking pin between the activities within the project and the relevant EOSC working groups. We organized two very successful workshops um, that had active involvement of the EOSC working group members and many other projects and initiatives and stakeholders. And a third one, a final one, is currently being planned for um, May, June of this year. And we also have other instruments at our disposal um, to create alignment and synergies. We have collaboration agreements with other projects and initiatives, and we have quite close relationships with uh, different working groups and interest groups within the Research Data Alliance. And finally, we have um, in the projects, and we're very proud of that, a European group of FAIR champions, people who are FAIR experts in their own sectors and domains, who bring their knowledge to the project and also advocate for the project in the wider world. So when I look into the future, I think um, that um, Fair is Fair, of course, will continue to be um, a key contributor to the ongoing development of global best practices and standards for Fair. And we will also try to contribute to the strategic agenda uh, which is a very important guiding document of the new EOSC um, governance. And we will also um, create um, close ties with uh, the relevant uh, new operational bodies that will appear in the coming months, I think, um, under the EOSC, uh, new EOSC board of directors. And we um, are also now building up relationships with um, the infra EOSC 07 projects and of course, uh, the important EOSC future project. All of this will be crucial uh, for the success and the impact of the project. And in the spirit of collaboration, I would also like to invite anyone um, who wants to investigate the possibilities of working with Fair's Fair to get in touch with us. I would like to end this introduction with a short video that gives you the main highlights of the project and and also illustrates the success of Fair's Fair in bringing together and aligning fair related work, work in and also beyond Europe. Thank you um, very much.
Thank you very much, Ingrid. And now I call on our virtual stage, uh, Joy Davidson from DCC. My name is Joy Davidson, and I work with the Digital Curation Center, and the DCC leads Work Package 3 for Fair is Fair, and we focus on fair policies and practice. This session is going to look at the rules of participation for the European Open Science Cloud and consider how Fair is Fair is working to support their realization. The rules of participation underpin the policies, processes, and procedures required to provide assurance of openness, quality, and trust in the practices and services offered by EOSC. One of the main goals for Fair is Fair is to deliver the essential fair dimensions to the rules of participation. It's important to stress here that the rules of participation didn't exist when Fair is Fair started back in 2019. Um, they have been developing over the, the course of the last couple of years. There have been several versions and as they have evolved, Fair is Fair has been keeping an eye on things and feeding into their development so that we can be aligned with the, uh, the rules as they progress. One of the things I wanted to stress is that the EOS vision requires the participation of lots of different stakeholders. So we have end users, we have data and service providers, and there's an acknowledgement that within and between these groups, there is lots of different degrees of maturity when it comes to fair data practices. Um, it's important that we realize that fair is a journey as well as a final destination. And there's no single route to becoming fair, but la rather lots of steps that people can take to become more fair enabling. Um, by becoming more fair enabling, we also believe that uh, service providers will be able to be more compliant with the rules of participation and to become more active and engaged contributors to EOSC. So for the next few minutes, we'll have a look at some of the work that we've been doing in Fair is Fair over the last year and a half and look towards some of the ongoing work that we have in the year coming up. So first of all, I just wanted to provide a little reminder of what the rules of participation actually say. Um, I won't go through this list in detail, but you can have a look at it. Um, we will come back to each of these in turn as we go through the next few minutes. I think it's important to make clear uh, that the rules are intended to be high level, simple, and lightweight. Um, the rules apply to all of the those interacting with or benefiting from the EOSC, and as I've noted before, this includes end users, resource and service providers, but also those developing software tools, workflows and training. So this is version 5, 0 0.5 of the rules of participation. Um, we have, as I mentioned, provided some feedback on uh, the various iterations. And as we've looked at the rules, we believe that we are working to address most of them. Um, there is one that we don't really think that we're doing that much to support, but we think for seven out of the eight, we are working quite closely and, and aligned with uh, the rules of participation. So for the next few minutes, we will take a look at each of the rules of participation and give you a flavor of some of the work that we're doing in Fair is Fair to support their implementation. Um, it's important to note that the examples we're gonna give are not an exhaustive list of what Fair is Fair is working on, but just a sample of some of the things that we're doing. So the first rule of participation is that the EOSC is based on the principles of openness and is as open as possible and only as closed as necessary. Uh, so for Fair is Fair, we definitely see Fair as an enabler of open science. Um, it's important to stress here that Fair and open are not equivalent concepts. Um, during our landscaping activity for Work Package 3 and 6, um, we found that the concepts of open and fair are often confused. Um, there can be really good reasons for not sharing data, for example, uh, for ethical reasons, for commercial sensitivities. And it's important to note that closed data can still be made fair. One of the recommendations that we produced in our D3.3 report 
um, made clear that we think that policymakers should require that metadata should be made available, making clear why any data that can't be shared can't be shared and to provide some sort of a, a rationale for that. Um, our landscaping work also reveals that it is currently really difficult to compare the coverage and the content of open science policies. And as we're looking at the EOSC landscape, it's important to see what sort of open science uh, policies are in place. Um, and looking forward, one of the things that Fair is Fair is trying to do is to work collaboratively to try and define a common set of policy elements that should be included in open science policies and how to describe these in a more structured way to support comparability of the content. Um, in addition, this more structured approach to describing policies will support both human and machine readability. Uh, and this is certainly something that is envisaged with the um, EOSC landscape as uh, identified in the strategic research and innovation agenda. There's uh, an aim to try and monitor the open science policy landscape uh, over the next few years to see how it's evolving. Um, to do that, we need to be able to see not only that policies exist, but what is covered in the policies. So we think that the work we're doing um, will hopefully help to support the vision um, outlined in the SRIA document. So rule number two, um, data in the EOS will, as far as possible, be made available in accordance with the FAIR principles. Uh, I think it's important to note with this rule that there is no threshold for FAIR at this point. Nobody has decided what exactly that means in practice. Um, the key with the rules of participation is really to be um, more open and transparent about how self-assessment of FAIR is, is carried out. So to this particular rule, FAIR is FAIR is working um, on object assessment metrics. We uh, developed a set of 17 metrics um, that have been out for public comment for um, the past few months. Um, these are a work in progress. Um, they build on the work of the RDA FAIR data maturity model working group, as well as others. Um, but we do help, I do believe that these sorts of metrics are very useful in supporting the transparency around how fairness of data sets are assessed. Uh, we also, based on some of the, the work we did around the metrics assessment, um, built that into our Fuji tool, which is a programmatic way to um, assess the fairness of data sets. Uh, so we've worked so far with five trusted digital repositories to pilot uh, the tool. And the source code is freely available in GitHub. So we know that a lot of other people are uh, another, a lot of other people are playing around with the, the tool as well, which is great. So we're continually trying to monitor how we can improve the interface and make it more usable. Um, we've also been very much trying to align our efforts in trying to um, cooperate around the notions of certification. Um, so we see that Fair, Fair is Fair is one of the front runners in trying to progress this collectively. Um, there was a workshop held in November last year and a workshop report came out um, not long afterwards that describes all of the various certification activities in the various EOS related projects. So some of the work that we're coming up with, as I mentioned, there is ongoing work to enhance the, the Fuji tool. Um, and we are keen to learn from the experiences of people making use of it for fair data assessments. Um, but we're also very aware of the fact that the fair itself doesn't make any reference to uh, how long data should be kept fair for. So we are working um, to try and promote the notion of fair over time in some of the work that we're doing with uh, certification. Um, to that end, we are developing the concept of core trust seal plus fair, and we can maybe pick up on that in some of the dis discussions later. Rule number three, uh, the EOSC aims to build a coherent infrastructure that removes silos and provides integration of data and services. So in this respect, um, Fair is Fair actually has an entire work package that is looking um, at the interoperability, um, particularly semantic interoperability for repositories. 
Um, we have a dedicated uh, support program where we've been working with 12 repositories um, and they have been testing uh, an implementation of a fair data point to, to see how that might support interoperability. Um, one of the things we'll be doing in FAIR's FAIR Work Package 3 is to try and package up some of the lessons learned with the repository support that is happening in Work Package 2 and also in Work Package 4, which is focusing more on uh, certification. But we want to try and share those um, practical implementation tips on what works and, and what doesn't. Um, we are also developing a framework for assessing FAIR services. Um, repositories fit within that concept as well. Um, but this framework is definitely something that we see as filling a, a gap. And the work is, again, iteratively going forward. Um, there have been a few uh, versions of the report coming out, and the final report will come out in August next year. Uh, but the framework and the methodology, we think, are certainly things that will be of great assistance to anyone who is looking to become actively engaged as a service provider for the European Open Science Cloud. Rule number four, uh, the EOSC is based on principles of ethical behavior and integrity. Um, so to this end, Fair is Fair has been doing quite a bit of work on developing data stewardship training in Work Package 6. Um, this activity includes a module on ethics, integrity, and responsible research and innovation. We've run um, several of these data stewardship training events now over 2019 and 2020. Um, Part of what we do at some of these sessions is to try and get the participants from uh, organizations thinking about um, ethics and processes at their own institutions and how these might be better integrated to support workflows um, and hopefully get this to be a, a more joined up process for the researchers. We've also been working to define a competence framework in Work Package 7 for Fair is Fair. And that also touches upon concepts of ethics and integrity as part of good research practice. Coming up, uh, we are starting work now to develop model curricula, which will help to embed fair aligned practices into university education programs so that researchers coming into uh, the workforce have a better idea of some of these concepts and are more able to be kind of fair practitioners um, from the outset. So as part of this activity, there will be an implementation handbook, which will help different universities to um, uptake the model curricula. Um, we're also looking to try and flesh out examples of good practice. Um, we are referring to these as implementation stories. Um, and one of the areas that we're keen to explore is some activities where we know that institutions are trying to integrate ethics processes into their data management planning workflows, and we think that there's great potential to try and uh, show these examples as um, things that others might want to replicate. Rule number five is that EOSC users are expected to be a community that fuel the EOSC with everything provided by the EOSC. Um, from our point of view in Fair is Fair, this largely depends on being able to find and use Fair data. Um, to this end, we have partners in Fair is Fair who are working to um, ad adapt the Fair repository finder tool um, within RE3 data and to try and make that more usable for people who want to search for um, both repositories that meet criteria for being fair, but also to be able to then uh, exploit the data that is held within these fair aligned repositories. Um, this work is ongoing. Um, it is feeding into the data site commons and uh, our recent report, uh, Milestone 4.8 report does cover a little bit of the planned activity and we would uh, suggest you take a look at that. Um, we're also doing a bit of work to pilot um, metadata catalog integration. Um, we've been looking to do this collaboratively with some of the cluster projects so that we can get a, a thematic input. 
Um, and the idea is to look at the DCAT standard as a way of making repository metadata catalogs more interoperable. Um, the work is continuing, it's just starting uh, in earnest. We had the proposal for the, the integration that came out late last year. Uh, the pilot is starting to move forward now. And in addition to that, we've been looking at the relationship between DCAT and also DDI, CDI and trying to see how these fit together. And uh, this will certainly be something that we continue to explore during the pilot, which will run uh, through the next few months. Uh, and a report is due out in October this year on the lessons learned. Uh, we'll certainly be sharing those lessons learned to the wider repository community and providing some tips to uh, repositories that might want to make their metadata catalogs more interoperable going forward. So we've grouped together here rules six and seven. Um, this is very much focusing on the behaviors of EOSC end users. And there's a, an expectation that EOSC users will adhere to the terms of use for the resources they use. And also that they will uh, make reference to the resources that they use. Uh, within Fair is Fair, we see that these rules um, really depend on researchers as end users understanding the, the general good practices um, associated with, with aligning with FAIR. Um, so to support these rules of participation, we have come up with uh, a FAIR aware tool. And this really helps researchers and also data stewards to become more familiar with the um, FAIR principles in a more practical sense. Uh, they essentially get an interface where they work through 10 questions. Um, the questions really help the, the researchers and as I mentioned, data stewards. Um, to assess current practices, what they're currently doing, and maybe where they might be able to make some uh, improvements. It's intended to be um, something that doesn't take a huge amount of time. I, I think it should take about 30 minutes to work through the 10 questions, but it will give people a general sense um, of what they're doing and where they might possibly be able to make some minor adjustments or major adjustments to, be, to become more fair. Um, one of the good things about the tool is that hopefully as people work through it, they will probably realize that while they may not be calling their activities or practices fair, they may well recognize that a lot of the things they're currently doing do align with fair. And we hope that it is uh, a, an encouraging tool as well as informative. So we see this as um, a, a useful tool for researchers. And some of the upcoming work, um, we are looking more at how the tool can be used by data stewards to be um, repurposed for training that is offered at the uh, organizational level. Um, to this end, we actually are taking part in one of the uh, shock training the trainer boot camps in May to present uh, a session on how the fair aware tool might be used in this context. Uh, the results of that will be made visible through shock, but also through the fair fair website. So that was a quick run through of, of the rules of participation and how we believe Fair is Fair is helping to support their realization. I think it's important for us to remember that Fair is Fair is certainly not alone in this uh, space. There is a lot of uh, relevant project work going on in the other uh, Infra EOS projects. We do try to work closely with them through the EOS task force that have been set up to um, encourage cooperation, but also through Fair is Fair, through our synchronization force, where we have a series of three workshops that bring people together to try and ensure that we're uh, supporting things in a more coherent and collaborative way. So what's coming up next for Fair is Fair is really the first year and a half of the project have been looking at the landscape, coming up with some recommendations and uh, some tools to try and help people to put FAIR into practice. Um, for the rest of the project, much of the efforts will be on supporting and guiding the rollout and, and take up of some of these recommendations and tools. One of the new things that we brought in over the last few months is some EOSC readiness roadshows. Um, these are intended to try and, and be run at a national level 
so that people can understand a little bit more what's going on at the national level and how Fair is Fair might be able to support uh, activities. Um, another key thing for us will be to continue to engage with the EOSC governing bodies and the EOSC Association um, as they firm up some of the uh, structural documents and rules of participation going forward. So that will be a key goal for us over the next year and a half, or actually the next year of the project. So I think that's been pretty much a quick run through of what Ferris Fair is doing, and we will open it up to some comments and questions a little bit later. Thank you very much, Joy. And while we move through the presentation from Ilona von Stein, I remind you that you can ask any questions already now in the chat and we will keep them for the question answer moment. Good morning, everyone. My name is Ilona von Stein, and I work with Dance in the Netherlands. I'm a work package lead in Ferris Fair around Fair certification. And this morning, I would like to highlight another significant and promising focus in the Ferris Fair project, and that is Fair assessment, metrics, and certification. To implement Fair in the broad sense, there are many aspects that should come together to turn FAIR into a reality. A first thing one might think of are data objects. And indeed, I think, yes, FAIR data objects are critical. However, FAIR data can only exist in a FAIR ecosystem. In such an ecosystem, all components are needed to support FAIR. Because image always has the last word, I decided to include this picture here of the European Union Youth Orchestra. All those players work together and they are all truly essential. The notes in the music, they are one thing, but it's the players, the rhythm and the dynamics that collectively bring the music to life. And in line with this metaphor, we need the many components to make the fair symphony work. Therefore, the fair is fair approach to assessment and certification is based on the concept that data objects need to be considered into their context. Let's start with the data objects. Fair is fair implemented two recommendations of the turning fair into reality report that relate to data objects. One, we have developed assessment metrics for data objects and two, we have developed a fair data assessment tool to perform fair data assessments. In this presentation, I would like to talk you through both of them. This is the first one. Let me point out the fair data assessment metrics first. Uh, these metrics are core metrics to evaluate the fairness of objects within trustworthy repositories. Our metrics are based on prior global indicators and initiatives. And at the moment, they are still refined and revised. So you can still have your say in it. You're more than welcome uh, to go to the link and uh, have your say on, the, on these metrics. Fair is Fair developed the Fuji tool, and this is our automated fair data assessment tool. It runs practical tests that are implemented against those metrics. And the tool supports the programmatic assessment for published data sets within repositories. It's uh, available for testing. Um, it's still work in progress, but it's already open source. And one thing which is, might be interesting to mention as well is that uh, the tool adheres to existing web standards and external registries and resources. You can find the source code, by the way, on GitHub. I will show you the link later. On this slide, you see two versions of the Fuji Fair Data Assessment Tool. On the left-hand side, you see a machine actionable version. And on the right-hand side, uh, you see the graphical user interface that we are currently developing to allow also for a better, uh, better human-friendly way of communicating the results and the communications. 
Uh, for both versions of the tool, it works really easy. Uh, you provide a valid persistent identifier or a URL of the data set. Fuji runs its tests and provides you uh, an output, for example, on the left hand side in JSON form in JSON format with a lot of verbose debug messages and suggestions for improving data fairness. Fair data assessment is a continuous process and therefore we have integrated into the design of our Fuji2 an iterative consultation process. We run this process with more than five repositories. You can see them uh, at the bottom and we test this. Uh, we test our tool with them. Not only we receive feedback from them on how we as a project can improve the Fuji2, but more important, also the tool provides them practical recommendations for fair data improvement. And with this, we provide practical guidance on how they can increase the level of the data fairness in their repositories. In the current EOS can fair landscape, there are many initiatives and projects working around the topic of fair data assessment. And fair as fair is a front runner in aligning the variety of fair data assessments in Europe. For example, we have initiated a collaborative workshop resulting in an alignment report, and we were trying to find synergies there, avoid duplicate efforts, and focus on disciplinary practices. So let's move to the context of the data objects, which are data repositories. It's necessary for data objects to remain fair over time. Metrics and assessment tools often produce only a snapshot of fairness. And in order for data to remain fair over time, it's crucial to stress that the journey towards fair depends on where the data set is preserved. There is a strong need for fair enabling trustworthy repositories. We need trustworthy repositories that can demonstrate that they enable and support the provision of fair data. This is also reflected in our fair is fair approach on trust plus fair. In our project, we have a focus on both the repository perspective and the object perspective. For the repository assessment, the project is leveraging on core trust seal certification and we extend it with fair enabling characteristics. And for the object assessment, we work with our Fuji approach I've just presented to you. Together, we unify the repository and object assessment in our focus on trust and fair. So trust for the repositories and fair for the data. And together with the right levels of preservation, curation and data storage, this will lead to fair data over time. In our core trust seal plus fair work, we engage with 10 selected data repositories in their preparations for the core trust seal certification. At the same time, we learn from those repositories valuable lessons uh, about their fair enabling practices. Their lessons will inform us as a project how we might better develop support and guidance towards certification and fair, also for a wider repository audience. Here you see some details of our repository support program. We've run a couple of workshops, uh, both face to face when it was still possible and uh, also online. We provide practical tools and training material, an important aspect was also that we test peer reviewed their core to seal applications and we've provided a lot of one on one support and advice. Our experiences and lessons learned will also enable us to share recommendations for integrating FAIR into the core trust seal repository requirements. Along the same lines, we are in the process of developing capability maturity models towards FAIR certification. Our capability maturity models will help repositories to define and achieve target levels and also goals and work on their continuous improvement. Our core to steel plus fair work will be of benefit to a wide variety of stakeholders. First and foremost, I think uh, the researchers, 
because repositories can take the burden of individual researchers in making and keeping their data fair, but also, for example, the publishers and the funders, they will also benefit. And of course, the repository data services itself, because uh, adhering to fairness standards and certification requirements will really improve their practices. We are now switching gears to another section in the FAIR symphony, that is research software. And the importance of research software is also recognized in the Turning FAIR into Reality report uh, in recommendation 16 that calls for applying FAIR broadly and it explicitly includes software. In order to analyze and formulate meaningful recommendations relating to fairness for software, it's important to recognize that software can play a number of possible roles. For example, it can be studied as a tool, as a research outcome, or as an object of study. And in our work, we focus on the last two. So on software as a research outcome, which in turn may also become the object of study itself. We focus on bridging the, between the research software community and the FAIR community at large. I won't go into the details, but if you're interested, uh, I've provided here a link to an assessment report on the fairness of software. It provides an overview, a literature review, and 10 recommendations for the creation uh, of fair guiding principles for research software. It's important to realize that this is not an end. Uh, actually, our work already feeds into the uh, RDA Fair for Research Software Working Group. Moving on to my last section in the FAIR symphony, I'd like to speak about how services might enable FAIR data. And also this work is clearly motivated by the vision of the Turning FAIR into Reality report. It clearly underlines the importance of services and infrastructure, which researchers need to effectively carry out their work. And there's also a growing awareness of uh, that FAIR enabling services are also a driver and enabler for open science at large. Uh, however, there is for service owners uh, currently little guidance on how to make their service fit uh, in the FAIR data ecosystem. And this is what we've been doing in the FAIR's FAIR project. We are proposing a basic framework for FAIR service assessment. It contains guidance, recommendations and best practices. The basic assessment framework contains high level objectives and for each objective it uh, contains detailed recommendations which are meant to be ready, readily actionable for service owners. It is divided into six categories, uh, three more technically oriented and three are more socially oriented. I would like to conclude with an outlook on next activities regarding the fair data object assessment we will focus on testing improving and consulting on the metrics we will keep improving and ultimately release the fuji tool both the machine actionable version as well as the gui version also we will further liaise with other eosc and fair initiatives on fair data testing regarding fair enabling repository certification our focus will remain on trust plus fair. We will keep on internal testing and also try to integrate with other ongoing initiatives. We will work on providing recommendations to integrate fair into core trust seal requirements. Uh, in we will do this together with the core trust seal board. Also, we will keep su supporting uh, repositories and we will provide guidance on their journey towards trust and fair. Regarding fair assessment for software and services, we will improve the, the basic assessment framework and ultimately we will make it public. Uh, it will be in August 2021. I would like to thank you very much for your attention. And if you have any questions, I'm happy to answer any. Thank you again, Ilona, uh, for these presentations. Um, before moving to our interactive uh, Mentimeter session, I suggest to 
welcome some of the questions that you might have. We have one already received uh, that is of interest, I think, for the audience. Uh, it was um, asked by Michelle Barker and it deals with the uh, FAIR uh, software activities that First FAIR is also addressing. So the question was, so when the community endorsed FAIR principles for research software, uh, what, what are the opportunities for first fair initiatives to include this work to support reproducibility of research software by having both fair data and fair software? So this, uh, as mentioned by Lon, I mean, the very last part of the presentation is a part of the first fair work will be addressed in the second part of the event and in the next months of the project. But I invite Jessica Parland. Uh, to better explain this and address the question to the audience. Well, thank you. Um, um, this is very, very good news and nice, fantastic to hear, Michelle. Uh, we are, of course, very, very interested to to be uh, made aware of all this and and please, please send us information. We only had one milestone that really addressed explicitly software. But we will, of course, collect this, this information and, and uh, spread it and include it in, in our communication. So this is really valuable and we welcome, welcome all these initiatives and, and include them in, in our further work. Thank you. Thank you, Jessica. And uh, in case there are any other questions from the audience, I invite you to raise your hand or write them in the chat. Well, if not, then I would suggest to move on with the uh, interactive uh, session. And I invite Ingrid still again to get ready for the first panel discussion. And I also invite our panelists to turn their videos on and prepare for the next half an hour discussion. Thank you very much, Sara, and um, hello, everyone. Um, I hope we um, can um, activate you a little bit in this session. That would be very nice. It would be nice to, uh, to have your participation in this meeting as well. Can I first ask um, our four panelists to maybe turn on their cameras? That would be really nice. Um, so, the idea is the following. I would like to ask everybody to go uh, to um, this uh, Mentimeter poll with the code 83996422. And um, now I'm going to see whether I can get um, the people who have their cameras on on my screen. Just a sec for that. Okay. Um, what I would like um, to do now is first introduce um, the four panelists to you. And uh, while you are starting up your mentor, you can maybe already try to answer um, the first question. So we have four people in our panel. Um, and I will introduce them to you in alphabetical order. Um, they represent different important stakeholder groups of um, FAIRS FAIR. So we have Juan Bicaregui, um, and Juan is the head of the data division in the scientific computing department at SDFC in the UK. He was coordinator of the former EOSC pilot project and a member of the former EOSC executive board. And Juan led the EOSC working group on rules of participation. Second panelist is Patricia Clark. Patricia, is program manager EU programs and policy at the Health Research Board in Ireland. And she has a particular interest in open research and is responsible for the HRB Open Research and Open Publishing Platform. And we are very lucky to have her also as the chair of our high level advisory committee. And then we have Françoise Genova. Françoise is the former director and now emerita researcher at the Strasbourg Astronomical Observatory. And she has been an active member of the Research Data Alliance right from the start and co-leads the RDA France National Node. 
And Françoise was also the vice chair of the former fair working group of the EOS executive board. And last but definitely not least, we have Eivke Smit. And Eivke represents STM, the International Association of Academic and Professional Publishers, where she is director of standards and um, technology. And we are very proud to have Eivke as one of our Fairs Fair champions. So after this introduction, I would like to go to the first question that we have, and I see that the answers are already coming in. And the idea is that they also provide some inspiration um, for our speakers. And that first question, um, I think, is, is right at the heart of the rules of participation that Joy uh, spoke about. Um, I think um, one of the biggest challenges, of course, is um, um, for the uh, working group also on um, the rules of participation, um, where to put the threshold in the EOSC between, on the one hand, enabling FAIR, and on the other hand, being open and inclusive. So where do you put the bar? How high should you place that threshold? So the question um, to our panelists is, is raising that bar over time the best strategy? And I think for that question, I would first like to give the floor to Juan, because I'm pretty sure that he has put already a lot of thought in this question, uh, being um, the co-chair of that Rules of Participation Working Group. So Juan, the floor is yours. Thank you, Ingrid. Yeah, it's a pleasure to be here. I'm sorry, I'm having internet trouble in the last few minutes. Um, I've lost the connection a few times, so I hope it stands up um, while I'm speaking at least. Uh, this is a very interesting question, and I think And it looks like we're losing Juan already. So that is a bit of a shame. Um, so maybe um, let's move on to um, uh, the other panelists and see whether Juan comes back to us again. So maybe Patricia, would you like to uh, step in? Yeah, uh, good morning, everybody. And thank you very much for the invitation to, to join you on the panel. Um, I mean, absolutely, I, I would agree that, um, that we should uh, raise the bar as the best strategy uh, for moving forward. And I think, um, looking at the um, comments that are coming in through the Mentimeter. Um, I think that seems to be the general sentiment. I mean, for for my role and uh, from the HRB and the Irish approach, um, open data, fair principles, research data management um, are all relatively recent additions uh, to the Irish research landscape. So we need to build a, a supportive, efficient um, environment and that takes time to embed in the system. Um, within our own policy, we we were very clear um, recognition that in some instances, particularly working in the health research sphere, um, that data can't be made open, but we require metadata um, underpinning the data to be openly av available, um, discoverable and accessible, um, and also justification on why data can't be open. But we definitely see this is as a as a process that will develop over time and um, that there is a lot of learning and um, that needs to be embedded. So we do apply the FAIR data principles um, under an, an open as possible, as closed as necessary sort of uh, principle um, that takes into account privacy, security, public interest, ethical issues, policy um, and practices, etc. And we do feel that um, not everybody is at the same level in terms of the different disciplines and that some people will need more um, support um, than others. Thanks very much, Patricia. Um, maybe we can go back to Juan again, because I see um, at least the video moving again. Juan, are you there? <laughs> and gone he is. <laughs> Françoise. Uh, yes, uh, I will speak from uh, the the fair working group uh, perspective, which is the working group is over, but we have produced recommendations on different aspects of fair. And I have to say that being inclusive and opening the 
a door to, for people and services to participate in the EOSC were the main keywords, I would say, of what we have been doing in the working group. So uh, the inclusiveness, we, we, we said that it includes both taking diversity into account and as was said before, to consider FAIR as a journey. And uh, so we also recommended not to reinvent the wheel. So we started, we had to define metrics for the EOSC, FAIR metrics for EOSC. And we started from the RDA recommendations of a FAIR data maturity model working group. And we selected uh, some of the, uh, the criteria that we thought were uh, relevant, the most relevant to the years. And we also used this stepped approach, what we, you say about rising the bar over time, in particular for the aspect links to uh, discovery licenses and standards, which are included in the FAIR principles. So I think that we have taken that approach but it's not the only thing about inclusiveness. There is an absolute need to test everything in front of the practices of many communities and also to help communities to understand what FAIR means for them and to set up what is needed, which means the community standards to enable FAIR for their own needs. So uh, we have also to remember uh, the six recommendations for implementation of FAIR, which were also one of the products of the FAIR working group, and to uh, the fact that there is a, an absolute need to, to support communities to develop, adapt, and maintain their standards. Uh, and also that the communities have to set up the governance of their own standards. So another aspect is at the present time to use the criteria mostly to help people, people to progress and to incentivize them to progress and not as a pass and fail uh, process. Thank you very much, Francoise. Um, Eivke? Yes, thank you, Ingrid. And in general, thank you for being here and for being invited. Uh, I very much agree with Francoise that all of this is a journey and the journey works best if you do it step by step. And I wanted to give some examples of what we learned among the publishers. Because uh, last year, STM started a big program uh, which we called the Research Data Year. And uh, we took a lot of publishers on our journey to make them share link and site data more than they do. And uh, the success of the program was in the fact that uh, some of the very advanced publishers who were doing this already uh, formed a group with publishers who had very little experience there. And by sharing that experience, uh, the newcomers could come on board. And then you can see how fast things go. So that is sort of a, um, yeah, a promotion of inclusiveness and not putting the bar too high uh, at the beginning. And I can share some data with you. You know, we're talking about data, so maybe you'd like to hear some uh, data. In general, we found that if a journal doesn't promote anything, the sharing of data alongside publications remains below or up to five, six percent of all the articles published. But if you start promoting the sharing of data, uh, it can quickly grow within a few years to 25, 30%. And of course, we now would like to see it even higher. And uh, last year, we managed to get 13,000 journals uh, join our program. So that is uh, quite a bit. Uh, and what we saw was that uh, at the start of the program, on average, 7% of the articles had research data uh, available alongside in, in repositories and, and wherever uh, people could uh, deposit them in, in archives. So at the beginning, it was 7% of the articles. And at the end of the year, we were at 15%. And we have an aim now to raise that to the 25% that I mentioned before, but it should be able to, 
to get much higher. And what I wanted to say about the step-by-step -step approach, we've been concentrating on the F and on the A of FAIR, um, making them findable and making them accessible. And now the second stage of our program, we are more focusing on the I and on the R, the, interoperab the interoperability and the reuse, you know, making sure that uh, data ends up in uh, fair enabling repositories, uh, that they're being assessed via something like Fuji tools and things like that. And uh, maybe also introducing uh, more data peer review. But so far in our step one, we've said, let's first push sharing, linking and citing so that at least these data become available and become linked to publications so that people can understand uh, what the data means. Thanks very much for that, Eivke. Um, and thanks everyone who um, answered the question in the Menti. I think listening to all three of you and also watching um, the answers um, coming in, um, there seems to be some agreement that we definitely need a gradual approach and that we need to see this over time. Um, and what I also like is that people are suggesting, you know, when you raise the bar, you need to uh, make sure that people are enabled to um, comply with that bar. So I think that's an important one as well. So I think uh, Juan is back now and um, being, um, you know, um, uh, having been very busy with the rules of participation over the last two years, I think it's fair to give him um, the final word on this. So Juan, go ahead. Ah, you're muted, Juan. Hello, everybody. Um, sorry for the um, internet problems that seemed to strike just as I was about to speak. Um, so I'm back on via my phone now. Um, yeah, I think <clears throat> I agree with everything that's been said. If we go back to the very original um, European Cloud Initiatives communication from the European Commission, the EOSC was there for all the researchers in Europe. <clears throat> and if it's going to be there for all the research in Europe, it has to be there for those that are using fair data and those who may not yet be using fair data alike. So it has to be open and inclusive um, in its very nature. But of course, achieving quality is also essential. Uh, users of EOSC have to know what it is they are accessing and using. So I think we have to achieve this quality and this fairness via transparency rather than gatekeeping. It's not that if something is not fair, it shouldn't be allowed on EOSC. It just should be very, very clear how fair things are. So we do that through badges, certificates, measures of fairness, etc. cetera. Um, just to emphasize that, I'd like to give an example that if a particular resource is unique, um, it might be a piece of new software or some new data that's completely novel, then we may want to use it irrespective of how accessible or interoperable it is. We may be willing to put in a lot of effort to reuse that resource to make it uh, work with the, the research that may have to adapt it or improve it. Um, so we, that should be available, even if it doesn't meet the high standards of interoperability, for example. On the other hand, if something is a fairly standard facility, maybe some cute compute resource or something, then we may be more fussy about how interoperable and how easy to use it should be, because we will pick the ones that do meet the criteria out of the many similar resources available. So I think if you see these two different needs, both within EOSC, it's clear that we have to achieve high levels of fairness as, a, as an add-on, as a badge, as a desirable thing but it mustn't be a gatekeeping thing where you're not allowed on if you don't meet those needs. So by all means, um, let's have those measures of fairness. And I think we lose one again, but my feeling is also that he was more or less at the end of um, what he was um, going to say. So I suggest, because we have two questions left, I suggest we move on um, to the second question. Um, question in the Mentimeter and also question um, to our panelists. And um, this is a question um, 
around long-term digital preservation. So when you look at um, a lot of the EOSC-related policy documents uh, that have been published, you see that they all underline um, that maintaining data fair over time requires long-term digital preservation. And um, Ilona already spoke to that. She uh, made it clear that um, we need to make sure that we keep data fair over time and that for that we need to curate and preserve the data actively. Um, to my mind personally, I think that um, this aspect of keeping data fair is a little bit um, the elephant in the room in, uh, within EOSC. Um, so an important question then is, how can we make sure that the EOSC infrastructure includes long-term digital preservation? So um, for that question, so everybody who has a view on that, please um, go to the Menti and give us your ideas. Um, and I would like to start um, for this question with Françoise, because she comes from a domain repository and I'm pretty sure that she has some strong ideas about this topic. So Françoise, the floor is yours. <coughs> Thank you. So I think that uh, uh, I am not sure that it is a, an issue about the core EOSC infrastructure, uh, the place where you have storage, computing, and so on. But I, I strongly agree with you that uh, it has to do with uh, the place, what the data is, how it is curated, and what happens over time. So I, I would like to remind people that Preservation is not only conserving the bytes somewhere, but also enabling reuse over time. And it's very important to, to keep that in mind when you prepare the data for, uh, for putting it at, at the disposal of, a, of a users, I mean. So uh, I, I think that uh, lots have been, has been said during the talks before this uh, panel. And in particular, the fact that uh, lot depends on the, 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 the place the data is kept. And uh, the, the fact that we would like to support repositories to enable real preservation, which means long-term reusability of data is at the core of the question. So I don't think it's about the computing infrastructure but it's really about uh, what happens to the data during its life cycle so that it can remain usable all along the life cycle and over a long time. Thanks very much, Francoise. And so I can just add that uh, the effort to, to have core trust still uh, and uh, aligned still better with FAIR is certainly something in the right direction. Again, it's not to put a bar somewhere, but to support the repositories when they think about what to do to enable preservation and fair pre preservation of FAIR data. Thanks. Who would like to follow up on Francoise? Who can I give the floor? Um, yeah, I can go now if if I'm able. Um, <laughs> yes, um, I, I, of course, preservation is a vital part of um, research. Uh, we have nothing if we don't keep a record of how we got there. So it's extremely important. But we have to remember that preservation itself is not the end. The It's a means to an end. Um, the thing that we're aiming for it can be slightly different. It can be reproducibility of results, but it can also be repurposing of data for a different purpose. And those two different reasons why you might want to preserve lead to different requirements. And I think it's important to bear in mind which one of those we're trying to achieve. If we are merely trying to be able to reproduce the results as they were, then we can need to keep things as they were. We need to keep the same version of the software. Perhaps we need to um, have the data as it was. Whereas if we're trying to repurpose data for something else, we need to have a much richer description of the data so that it can 
uh, be put into a different field and still be uh, interpretable. So those different requirements need to be thought of. Um, that leads us to knowing how much we need to preserve when we do preserve something. Uh, what is the digital object that needs preservation? Um, it clearly has to be the, the data and the metadata around it, but is it also the software? Is it also the record of methodologies? Is it also some parameters? Maybe the instruments were set in a particular way, uh, those things as well. So drawing a line around what the digital object is that needs preserving is a very difficult task and it depends on the context. So we have to keep that in mind. Um, yeah, I think that it's worth mentioning that the executive board as the part of the co-creation activities that they did commissioned a report from the Digital Preservation Coalition called Fair Forever. Um, that's a very interesting report. Um, it has, it's based on some, um, some interviews and some focus groups that the DPC uh, ran. Um, some of the results were confirmatory to what we might expect. Everyone agreed that the um, preservation performance for particular uh, research activities should be audited against the data management plans that they put forward. Um, there were mixed views about whether we can trust research institutions to preserve the data that's behind uh, the papers they publish. That was interesting. But particularly interesting for me was a couple of questions where the results were bimodal, where some people were strongly in favour and some people were strongly against. Um, for example, the results were bimodal on whether funding should be withheld if data from previous funding is not preserved. Uh, you can see why that might cause uh, interest. It also, um, a very similar question was about whether an institution should be held accountable if the data gets lost or goes dark. And again, there were uh, you know, some strongly in favor and some strongly against. So I would recommend that report. I think it has some very interesting recommendations. Thank you. Thank you, Juan. And it's also very interesting to see all the answers coming in that touch upon, I think, many aspects of, of, of this issue. So interesting to see um, the question around who is responsible for this. I think that that is a, a, a vital one. And also the aspect, uh, of course, repositories are mentioned by many, but also the aspect of um, funding um, these responsibilities and these roles is an important one, I think. Um, so let's move on. Um, Eivke, I saw your hand already. Uh, yes, thank you, uh, Ingrid. Uh, I wanted to make a connection between this question and the previous question about uh, raising the bar or be a bit more strict on requirements. If there's one aspect where I think that that would be useful, it is on this, on digital preservation and on making sure that data ends up in really reliable, long-term sustainable data repositories. Um, it is also something that we learned from the past year when, when journal publishers started to uh, encourage authors to do more data sharing, because the, one of the biggest questions that came back was, um, what is the best place where we put our data? And in some subject fields, that is very clear, huh? like in genomics or so, but also in, in earth science, there's much more infrastructure and people know where to go. But there are also many subject specific areas uh, where, where there's less of a tradition and where people think that any repository will do. And uh, in that sense, um, uh, I think it will help to have uh, a repository finder or, or more transparency on, on how reliable in the long term a repository is likely to be and, and more transparency on, on, on general requirements for, for digital preservation. Because I think it will be essential to work on interoperability, uh, reusability, reproducibility and, and things like that. Thanks, Eivke. And also within First Fair, of course, work is being done around um, a repository finder. Um, Patricia. 
Can you share your thoughts? Yes, yeah, God, uh, very interesting. And and even this morning, I've learned more about uh, preservation. I mean, I think building that um, knowledge base to inform uh, preservation, long term preservation is something that that is really needed. So I, I do have the uh, Digital Preservation Coalition report in my reading pile um, beside me at home here um, and also um, some of the FAIR data reports. I mean, for me, there's a tendency to think about long term preservation as something that needs to be considered at the end of the research project. So it's about pulling that back um, so that the issues around uh, roles and responsibility and the clarification and the funding for it um, beyond the term of the sort of research project itself um, needs to be considered more upfront, really. Um, and I mean, we've been relatively new to this in Ireland, but um, we've still seen this raised as an issue already around who is responsible for the data beyond the end of the grant and um, who funds it, where will it be held, um, all of those questions and who's responsible for driving that discussion. Um, I mean, as a funder, we fund fair data and verification and lots of things to do with active research, but the long-term preservation of the research data we see is something that others fund. So I think that's a conversation we probably all need to be engaged in at the beginning of the research. Um, and for me, the, the actual skills to preserve um, and getting direction on where to actually have that conversation and who to have that conversation with and the value that the FAIRS FAIR work brings to that have, have been really important for us. Um, I think it, it, on the costing um, coming from a funder's perspective, I mean, it's more about the cost of not preserving the data. So uh, for some things, it's pretty obvious, like the longitudinal studies, um, but for other types of research, um, uh, looking at what's the cost if, if this research is funded or what's lost to the system by not long-term uh, preservation of this data. So we've uh, kind of brought in some new funding schemes um, in the HRB looking at the dedicated to sort of the secondary uh, reanalysis of data that already exists in the system. And we see that as kind of driving the conversation sometimes. So it's about putting in those incentives um, and rewards for people to actually look at preserving the data so that it can be reused as well. Thanks very much, Patricia. And I think um, that with um, um, your thoughts and, and answers, we have touched upon um, a couple of very important aspects of this um, issue of long term digital preservation. Um, I wanted to make clear that we will definitely share um, the answers that we get within the Menti um, among all the participants. So um, this is really useful input, um, I think, for many of us. Um, so let's move on to the final question for this first panel. And this question um, really goes back to, um, to the whole concept of the FAIR ecosystem. And I think that FAIR ecosystem concept was first mentioned in the report, um, turning FAIR into reality. Of course, we started off um, in the FAIR context really with a, with a strong focus on, on FAIR data. But we know now and uh, that um, creating that necessary FAIR ecosystem requires much more and we need to enable FAIR beyond data and also look um, to other data objects and, and services as well, uh, digital objects and services as well. Um, so, for example, with software and services, and, and Ilona already spoke to that a bit, and I think Joy did as well. What according to you, are the biggest challenges uh, for the coming years uh, that we face? How, um, which hurdles do we still need to take uh, to achieve that fair ecosystem? Again, I think um, a big question, but it would be great if you could share some thoughts with us, and it would also be great to get the input um, from the participants in the meeting. So um, who would like to start with this question? Do I have any volunteers in the panel? I know it's a difficult one. <laughs> well, um, do you want to start? Yeah, sure. Um, so, yeah, it's it's about partly about what are all the different things that we need to preserve, and so what's the infrastructure we need for that. Um, 
we know software is very hard to keep going. Um, versioning is critical and we need to know which version of the software we want. Sometimes we want to be able to rerun the version of the software that was used in the paper. Sometimes we may want to run the latest version of that software, again, depending on what we want to do. So those certainly preserving software in the form that's uh, needed for different uses is a big challenge. Um, slightly aside from the question, I think it's also vital that we are able to preserve all the other aspects of the research, the methodologies, the workflows, the research instruments, um, even the hypotheses, etc. cetera. Um, so that's important too. Um, and that takes us on to the whole area of assessing which part of a particular piece of research is the innovative part because of all those different things. Some of them may be standard, whereas the real new work may be in any one of those, not just in the results. Um, so back to the challenges, I agree with Patricia and what she said in the last question. You can't separate the workflow that you go through um, during the research and the workflow that you're going to need to go through as in order to ensure the preservation. What I mean by that is that you have to be preparing for preparation right throughout the original workflow that you undertake during the research. In particular, you need to record the dependencies between the different things that, that are produced at the different stages. Um, you need to produce those, record those dependencies during the research so that when it comes to preservation, you know which things depend on which, so that you know which things need to be preserved in your, your sort of digital object package, which enables the reproduce, reproduction of the whole research. Um, if we, my own vision, and this is kind of um, ambitious, let's say, is that if we get the research workflow right and make all the right dependencies, record all the right dependencies during the research, then the preservation ought to be one click. At the end of the research, you say, ah, now I have a result I want to preserve. Let the, let the infrastructure trace back to how that result became, came about, all the things that uh, it depends on that you've been doing over maybe years uh, to get there and ignore all the things, all the blind alleys, all the mistakes you made, all the wrong turnings that were taken that did not contribute to the final result. So for me, that's the big challenge. It's laying down all the dependencies during the research so that preservation can become a very simple automated process of tracking back through all those dependencies to find which things need preservation. That really sounds like an ideal world. <laughs> <laughs> Who would like to respond to that? I can. Uh, I agree with everything that Juan says. And the only th aspect I would like to add is sort of the human centric one. Uh, because it, it requires a, a, a change in attitude and a, and a change in how people work uh, now. And uh, what we learned in STM's uh, research data year last year is that um, you need to work with all the stakeholders in that whole ecosystem to, to get this going. From the funders, the research institutes, the researchers themselves, you need to have an eye for uh, different habits in different uh, subject areas, and it, I think it's very important to uh, uh, to work with all those communities uh, to get this going. So that, that's the only thing I wanted to add. Always important not to forget the human element in all of this. Um, Patricia? Yeah, God, um, I mean, for me, it's really important to know where you're starting. And um, so, I mean, I mean, I've got a really good hand, I suppose, on the biggest challenges for us in enabling a fair ecosystem in Ireland, because we've just completed a, um, a landscape report, which is open for consultation at the moment. And that's been led by um, Tamia and Aoife um, under Daniel's coordination um, in Ireland. But um, it, I mean, it's left us in no doubt 
the actual large challenges there are there in making um, the, the Irish fair ecosystem a reality, but it's, it's, it's also allowing us to, to sort of identify coordinated actions that we can do across that ecosystem. And so there are some people who've gone quite far um, and some players who are just at the starting line um, and it's about setting the direction so that we can all move together in the one system. So, I mean, there are the usual sort of things that you would expect um, sort of around sort of communities of practice and trying to build sort of um, knowledge, I suppose, to look at sort of alignment um, of policies. Um, and national policies with a reference to FAIR and to make sure that they're all pulling in the one direction. So to have that national conversation, I mean, it means that we're all learning a common approach and um, that we were sort of telling the same messages and looking at coordination across how we can actually pull together rather than people or, or recognizing where some people have done things uh, and gone further and how that's worked and whether that should be taken up in other parts of the system. So for me, it's definitely, I mean, all of this takes time and effort and resources from all of the players across the system. And in some cases, resources that aren't there in terms of people's time, expertise, funding. Um, but it's about making this a priority so that people can come together and are given the space to actually look at this together. Thanks very much. Um for some reason, Françoise disappeared from my screen. Are you still there, Françoise? I, I am back. I, ah, I, there you I are. Missed, maybe it's better I, I stopped my video because uh, I was thrown away by the system. So I have missed most of the previous discussion. And uh, on my side, I would like to insist on the building blocks in practice. I think that the discussion was about the ecosystem as a whole and so on. But I think that it's important to keep in mind which are the key building blocks and to try to understand what they are, the pillars of the system in a sense. So I think that, of course, understanding what FAIR means for other aspects of the system than just data, we, we more or less <clears throat> maybe understand what FAIR means for data now. But uh, to, to work on what it means for the uh, other for other key elements, which is, uh, for instance, as was discussed before, software and services, but also what is fair vocabulary and what are all these things. I think it's a real work. And again, it has to be done seriously and there is work ongoing as you described, and it has to be tested. The results have to be tested in a variety of uh, circumstances and contexts. And also, when you define FAIR, you, you begin to have uh, the idea to have how you measure it. And it's really important to, to work on the criteria quickly before everybody begins to build a tool telling you this means it's FAIR and this is not FAIR. So I really think that there is lots of work to do. And for software, for instance, as was said, it's done in, uh, in VRDA, and there is also the work you do on services. But there are other elements which have to be also taken into account. And I also think that it may be more for the next panel, but semantic interoperability is one of the very, very tricky thing because uh, you have semantic practices in different communities, but they, they may not be all at the same level in, in, in those domains. And also, and I think here, this is what I heard from Juan more or less, but put in more practical terms. I think that defining what provenance means in the system, how you define provenance for the different aspects of the system. It's really also something which is very important and it's also very tricky to understand what it means and how to do it. Thank you very much, Françoise, for these additional thoughts. I'm very conscious of the time and we are running a little bit over time. So I think um, that we need to stop here. I am very conscious of the fact that um, we pose some tough questions for you. So I would like to thank all of our panelists very, very much for um, um, being here today and, and um, giving us their thoughts. 
And I would also like to thank the audience for um, giving us all the answers uh, that we will definitely capture and um, use within the project and also share with all of you. So with that, I'd like to hand back to Sara. Thank you, Ingrid, and thank you all for this very interesting panel. So we're now giving you a 15 minute break. So we'll reconvene at 11.45. You can leave your Zoom uh, as it is and just uh, take a rest. And the, the meeting will follow uh, with the second part with a similar structure to the one you've seen and, and, and a couple of new presentations from Pairs Fair. Enjoy your coffee or your tea and, and see you at 11.45.
So hello, welcome back. We are now ready to start the second part of this workshop. And then I'll give the floor to Elizabeth Newbold from STFC for a presentation about support training and skills. Not sure whether there is something wrong. We should have the, the video, the pre recorded video from Elizabeth now running. Give us a second to. Oh, great. Good morning. My name is Elizabeth Newbold, and in the next 15 minutes or so, I'm going to outline some of the activities that we are doing to provide support, training, and skills in relation to FAIR. So, due to the very nature of the FAIR's FAIR project, which is to supply practical solutions for the implementation of FAIR principles, support, training and skills are embedded in and across the different activities and work packages where we are concentrating on three core areas. Support for repositories and tools which are aiming to make repositories ready for FAIR and to make FAIR assessment easier and build researchers awareness through easy to use tools. Competence centres and trainings which is to provide hands-on skills for data stewards and to build a community and exchange platform for data stewards to exchange experiences and fair in higher education where we want to foster the next generation of researchers and professionals with fair knowledge and skills and to support higher education institutes in embedding fair skills in curricula. Whilst the activities are led by specific work packages, the activities complement and intersect with each other to provide a coherent package of support, training and skills development. One area of support that we are focusing on is providing support for repositories and this covers a broad range of interest, not just those who manage repositories, but also others who work to support research data management, such as data stewards. Within the programme of support for repositories, there's an overarching goal that all repositories can improve their practices and become more fair enabling. It's worth emphasising that we say fair enabling, as there's more than one route to fair and that fair is a journey and we want to help people to get there. We don't want to be too prescriptive about what the final outcome is going to be. The proposed transition support programme for repositories is outlined in our deliverable, which is available on Zenodo, and is focusing on supporting fair data provision, improved handling and integration of metadata, and an increased emphasis on data stewardship. The report pulls together recommendations from across the project and sets out how they are being or could be supported. Some examples of this include trustworthy repository certification support, which Alona has all outlined earlier. There were 10 repositories selected following an open call, and they've been receiving dedicated support throughout the programme. Other areas look at improving the findability of repositories and the use of tool like Fuji, again, this has already been mentioned, and the Fair Aware tool, which I'll say more about in a moment. Um, an example of how the work can provide support is as well as repositories is the repository of Finder Tool. And this is developing a registry for fair enabling repositories by extending the WE3 data repository Finder Tool. This will provide support to researchers who use the tool to locate repositories through improvements to the descriptions of the repository metadata. If you look at the repository for Finder Tool, just here you can see that you can limit a search to the repositories that meet the criteria that have been set out in the first project. The Fairware tool has been developed to help with human understanding assessment of data sets in repositories and is aimed at researchers and data stewards. The tool isn't designed to give a score for the fairness of specific data sets, but by guiding someone through the assessment process, the tool helps to better understand the fair principles. So the, the slide's a little bit blurry, but each question has contextualised information to help explain the question. And depending on the answer, 
um, to the question that you provide. Um, it, you will either, if you answer no, get the help screen pop up to tell you what this um, question is about and providing some context. And if you answer yes, you'll be um, presented with a scoring system so that you can say what degree of, of like, uh, probability you are likely to be able to comply with this. So in this way, the tool can also be used in training activities as a way of promoting fair principles with real life examples and providing some much needed context. As often people can find uh, training can be a little bit abstract and it isn't easy to apply to their own experiences. Hopefully that, that using this tool can, um, can, can bridge some of that gap. So the tool has been tested, um, it's available for use um, and undergoing further development. So have a look and give some feedback. Fair Competence Centre. Um, work has involved us reviewing the landscape and stretching out a structure of core, um, what we consider to be a core competence centre around three themes, which are advisory, harmonisation and dissemination activities. Um, ideally, a competence centre should be a place where connections can be made to share understanding and knowledge and provide a mechanism for communication, dissemination and outreach. Ideally, we would like it to be a two way process. Um, we see a competence centre as a shared hub of expertise in implementing fair data stewardship principles. To help with this, we've been developing the concept of fair data forum to help deliver and provide an entry point to a fair competence centre. We are still developing this, so, but so far I've used it to support some data stewardship training and events. And um, ideally it would be to signpost people to resources and tools to support fair. Um, and will be a place where people can interchange and exchange ideas with each other and ask for advice. Other activities that we've been looking at um, are relating to training materials themselves and uh, how we can make these more fair as a resource by applying emerging standards to the drive learning resources and fair data stewardship. Um, as identified in the work of the EOS Secretariat and their working groups, there's a real fragmentation in training resources and the quality and fairness of training and learning resources remains a challenge. So we hope that the work that we've been doing in collaboration with others can help to address some of these issues and can provide some recommendations back to EOS. And we've been looking at what is required um, around terminology and um, within this work, we are supporting the terms of fair skills and using training materials developed as part of the data stewardship training strand of our work as a use case for developing this terminology by trying to apply the vocabulary that's been developed in that project against our materials. So we've done this by supporting a workshop. Um, taking part in some hackathons to apply this latent terminology to the materials and feeding back where it's unclear, where the links aren't available, if the vocabulary is too complicated or isn't rich enough. We're also working alongside the Research Data Alliance Interest Group on education, training and funding research data. And here we are looking at defining a minimal set of metadata in the first instance, taking account of different use cases for learners, training providers and service providers. Um, it's really key that if we can all describe the, um, our training materials in a similar way, that there's more chance of them being findable and discoverable and reusable for others. The training for data stewards and data stewardships activities have been centred around three interrelated activities. So the first are summer schools, which are building on the CODIA to RDA Research Data Science Summer School for Early Career Researchers, which includes topics related to FAIR, with a parallel strand for data stewards, where there's a first week in common, a second week, the Early Career Researchers and Data Stewards split, and then there's shared exercises between the strands to facilitate the understanding and learning. This activity took place in 2019, and the plan was to continue doing this in 2020 and 2021. However, we have had to change our plans around this, which I'll, I'll explain in a moment. And we also are looking at training, training events for data stewards and franchised events where uh, local hosts could take the materials and develop their own activities. The challenges we've had around these activities have really uh, been due to the impact of COVID-19 on planning and delivering in-person events. 
So we've had to rethink how we are going to deliver training and I'm sure that many other people in the audience have had to do that as well. So we, the summer school became a virtual event for alumni of previous schools and some of the elements were related to fair. And we rethought the train trainer activities. Um, and when you're rethinking things, it's more than just delivering and doing it on Zoom. You have to actually rethink the whole approach. You can't take what was being a two week in person course and just say, oh, we'll put it in a Zoom meeting. So we've had to rethink the structure. And we tried to deliver this in more of a flipped learning style where materials were available in advance and then instructors and trainees come together to discuss the activities and the materials um, rather than a more traditional, I suppose, classroom style approach. So the courses have been developed in conjunction with local hall hosts with topics selected from a call list. Um, in November and December last year, we have um, piloted this approach with two different universities, one in the University of Manchester and the other in the University of Costa Rica. Um, so although there's been challenges with having to rethink the courses, um, it, it actually has been quite helpful um, because obviously one of the issues you need to address with training is how, how do you make training fit for purpose for multiple audiences and how do you make it scalable? You know, often training materials need repurposing for a particular audience, either to account for um, a different language or cultural environment, which is what we, we, we find with working with colleagues in Costa Rica, some things, terminology just doesn't equate and translate in a meaningful way for a different working environment. Um, and you also have to take account of the context and working environment. So the maturity of research data management activities in a particular discipline or an organisation. And some topics just don't translate well to a different um, working environment, particularly things like legal issues, because they need to be based on the jurisdiction that somebody is working on. So, so in that instance, you're sort of saying these are the elements to include in a course rather than these are the materials to put into a course. The other thing that takeaway message is um, that case study examples need to be wide ranging. And often we focus on best practice of a discipline or, a, or an organisation when presenting examples and case studies but these aren't always easy for other people to relate to and that you need a wider range of um, examples covering different maturity of an organisation. If you only ever present an ideal or the best practice, it can be quite off-putting to people who aren't on that trajectory and are earlier on in their uh, research data management and fair journey. And, and you basically want to be able to show incremental steps or what something might look like rather than this is the only solution or the perfect solution. So having had to rethink the courses, it, it's been actually very beneficial. The work package seven, uh, we're concentrating mostly on fair and higher education. And this is about the inclusion of fair and research data management skills within higher education programmes. So mainly within bachelor, master and doctoral programmes. Final outputs will be a competence framework for fair data in higher education, supported by training resources, capacity building workshops and good practice examples. Activities so far focused on establishing a mainly via bachelor skill provision in universities at the level previously mentioned, and this is done via surveys and focus groups. And we also collected and analysed different competence frameworks and training initiatives. Um, some of the findings and recommendations just to highlight is that bachelor or master level students are rarely listed as target groups um, and most research data management training appears to be targeted at doctoral or postdoctoral level so this is a, a, is a, a real gap and a recommendation is to establish a minimum level of awareness around research data management and fair and, and to look at providing more specific research data related skills throughout the university's education um, portfolio so, so moving away from just the focus on doctoral um, level or postdoctoral level. Um, the respective reports where these were outlines were of course available in Zenodo. And um, the work around this has been finalised most recently um, on the competence framework for fair data based on work done in, in the Edison project. Future activities in the last year of the project will work to make these results more practical to help universities develop fair and research data management skills within education programmes. 
So the main next step is now to define a competence framework that will be used as a basis for training materials and a fair adoption handbook. So firstly, on the left of the screen, um, we define principles and scope used, um, used within the higher education context linked to methodology within higher education, considered the job market demand and with an evidence base and linked with other standards, frameworks and resources such as Edison and considering data management as part of the data science professional family. Practical steps that we've done, we've tried to visualise this on the right of the screen. So again, analyse the job market, what knowledge, competence and experience is usually asked for. Map the other frameworks and resources as to where they provide relevant input, for example, definition of skills and competences, but also possible learning outcomes and use the Edison framework as the basis to further define fair data competence groups. This is all being finalised within the report, which is available in Snowdo. Now working on using it as a basis for model curricula and courses within the next activities, and this will include a book sprint and several workshops to build capacities within universities. And as I said, that's just a quick um, run through of some of the activities which we have been doing. There's more work to come with some more workshops for, for, for higher education and curricular development, as I said, including the book sprint, so do look out for that. We're looking at competence centre, expanding the content and usage beyond our initial use group of users, and obviously ongoing development of training activities and continued contribution to emerging standards. And finally, but certainly not least, do try the fair wear tool. Thank you. Thank you very much, Elizabeth. And apologies, we know this uh, recording, um, the volume of this recording was a bit low. So uh, we, we will make it available, of course, afterwards. But Elizabeth is here today. So I invite any of you um, uh, with some who has some questions to feel free and ask Elizabeth directly. So we will take uh, the time to answer that uh, after uh, Jessica's presentation now. So we'll have a, uh, a question and answer um, time before the panel, the next panel session. So um, Jessica, I now welcome you on the stage. So I'm Jessica Barlon von Essen. I'm, I will now talk about architecture in the first fair context. In our work in Work Package 2, we have identified three basic elements for creating robust fair data that is truly interoperable. These encompass persistent identifiers, metadata, and semantic interoperability. I will now talk about each of these three based on work that is done, especially in first fair work packages two and three. Persistent identifiers. There has been much important development during the last years within the OSC project, uh, which we have followed and built upon. In practice, there are still many ways to implement and use persistent identifiers in local environments. And the discussion sometimes seems a bit challenging due to different goals, cultures and ways of work. Metadata. Metadata creates the framework and essential context for the persistent identifiers. Uh, and it's the enabler of creating findability. Creating interoperability for metadata by working with mappings is essential for exposing metadata in interoperable ways. Semantic interoperability is in practice challenging to achieve as the technology and the implementations are not that mature in many domains or subdomains. Far from all tools and ways of working are truly fair enabling yet. The EOSC PID policy and architecture have provided a basis and framework for the work done here. The Work Package 2 task on persistence and interoperability aims at facilitating the implementation of PID solutions through, for instance, bringing different aspects of PID use into the discussion. There are, for instance, differences in what actually are feasible and smart solutions 
depending on the needs of the designated community. These might be different when we discuss research information, PID graphs based on information to support general discoverability and evidence-based decision-making analytics, uh, so on, for, on the on one hand, and the use cases where identifiers are needed in managing the resource process and data life cycle on the other. The contexts are of course interlinked and connected, but the use cases are very different. Also, there are differences in how deep the machine actionability needs to go depending on the data objects and the use context. Not all data is the same and the published PID is always a promise that sooner or later creates costs. The levels of machine actionability and return on investment might vary depending on data quality, structure, and researchers' needs and preferences. We should also avoid creating zombie PIDs or corrupting the system with PIDs that look like they will resolve, but actually don't. So this is an example of aspects we have presented in our deliverables concerning persistent and interoperability. For service providers, we have presented some guidelines and principles, what they can do regarding persistent identifiers to promote the implementation of them in a way that supports the fair data principles. The service providers play a key role as they decide when and how to allocate, provide, resolve and reuse persistent identifiers as integrated parts of their services. But of course, persistent identifiers are not enough. They need to be used in the context of metadata to offer value. The challenge is, of course, that metadata is highly dependent on the different types of data, research domains, traditions, methods, culture, and existing systems, and the needs of each designated community. It is neither easy nor cheap to switch or drastically change established metadata formats. And this is unfortunately also an area of organic development where the not invented here syndrome is a menace. It might feel so much easier to just create your own format than to really gain a deep understanding of other formats. The recent scientific research and innovation agenda for EOSC presented in July 2020 reflected the transition of the European science system and, the stress, and stress the need for a multi-stakeholder European partnership to enhance the circulation of research data and knowledge in the digital form across borders and disciplines. And to allow scientists and machines to collaborate in creating, storing, processing, finding, accessing and reusing scientific data. This new system must therefore facilitate the sharing and reuse of data and metadata across all scientific disciplines. FESFAIR is working to support the realization of an integrated, coherent and reliable research data approach for the EOSC to deal with the ideal performance of data-intensive cross-disciplinary and global collaborative research. Metadata catalogs are stated in the work package three deliverable uh, proposal on integration of metadata catalogs to support cross disciplinary fair uptake are not specifically mentioned in the fair principles, but they have become the key element for enabling research findability or even better discoverability. Principle F4 states that metadata are registered or indexed in a searchable resource, and this searchable resource happens to be metadata catalog, as we defined it here. The resource database where you can seek for the data sets that you know uh, they are in the, that resource, find, or the data sets that might be useful for you, but you did not know they were there, discover. The deliverable proposes a pilot to trial the integration of metadata catalogs to support cross interdisciplinary research among the selected domains of the, the, in the EOSC. 
the challenges facing the communities along with overviews of current activity were discussed during two, work two workshops with the stakeholders. And there were five clusters identified and five domain agnostic metadata schemas. The S3 clusters, of course, funded under the InfraEOSC for 2018. Uh, and using, they were using two domain agnostic metadata standards, the DCAT uh, version two or, or the application profile, and then the uh, DDI CDI data documentation initiative uh, cross uh, yeah cross domain integration, and then through fair, uh, be defined as a service provider. So these are the ones. Uh, we will be working with in this pilot. To really uh, gain semantic interoperability and ensure that meaning is not lost in, transi in transition, we have to focus even more on machine actionable semantics. The fair data object needs an ecosystem to support technical features, the metadata and the identifiers. And the repository offers the was the metadata catalog as mentioned, and this uh, enables then principle four, and also um, that the metadata are registered in an index, and also that the, the metadata is accessible when the data is no longer available, that's A2. So, but then how is this visible for the researcher? Of course, they can fetch, fetch the data if they know where they exist, but then they can search it. Uh, with this descriptive metadata as described. And, look, and the data object can, of course, be in different uh, repositories, which means that we need to be able to search in different, in different uh, metadata, uh, not only schemas, but also contents. So you know, and this uh, gives uh, some challenge to the search. Uh, but of course, in in uh, reality, no uh, researcher searches all uh, this with uh, by all the thousands of of, uh, of metadata repositories by hand. But we use these metadata aggregators to uh, find uh, and search and collect the metadata through the APIs. So, but the metadata aggregators only provides a part of the solution as, and this tend to elevate the general problem of metadata integration to the next level. Uh, so uh, there are actually um, several uh, issues with, with the APIs and the queries. We can still enhance the level of machine actionability and semantic interoperability by de de level, developing interoperable solutions that search search. And they often mention formats are like RDF or JSON and query languages like Sparkle, but they still offer immense flexibility and uh, they don't offer automatically a good uh, semantic interoperability. So uh, therefore, Work Package 2 also develops a reference implementation of the fair data point, already existing uh, solution. Um, but and now we're trying to to uh, further develop this. So one uh, important idea of this uh, solution is that the API also exposes the metadata model in a structured and machine readable way for uh, the harvesters to be used. And and in this. Uh, uh, reference implementation and this uh, sandbox so that we are already running repositories can try to expose their metadata to the reference implementation and test uploading metadata or they can also put their own up their own uh, fair data point uh, which then consists of the database to post on an API and test it and then this work can also be linked to or and is linked to the so-called work with the in the, with the semantic artifacts uh, and the work that is done in task 2.2. So 
the aim is to produce some practical guidance from this sandbox work uh, to uh, enable this, uh, making use of this potential value of the fair data point for repositories. So this uh, development and testing is done together with partner repositories. A very important piece of building interoperability uh, is of course the, the semantic artifacts mentioned. They should also be, um, we should also treat them, uh, all our control to vocabularies, voc vocabularies, thesauri and ontologies as fair data objects. So this means that they should also be described with metadata and they should also be machine actionable. And to this end, we have in cooperation with ontology experts from different domains published recommendations for fair semantics, and there's still one more version upcoming of this. This has been done in an iterative way. So we still have some things upcoming on persistent identifiers. We will be writing one more report about how to solve technical aspects of fair with persistence and interoperability. Regarding the metadata, the work is now progressing with a pilot and a mapping there and harvesting. And regarding fair semantics, uh, one more version of the recommendations will be, will be created uh, again with an iterative methods with workshops and close cooperation will continue not only with RDA, but also with the Oskila Synergy. And we're also looking for a new cooperation here uh, so that the fair data point uh, reference implementation uh, can be further developed and it will be published in a second version by the end of this project. Thank you. So many thanks, Jessica, for this uh, presentation. So we now welcome some questions from the audience. There were some uh, already in the chat during the uh, while the presentations were running, they have been addressed in particularly and um, so we, we might say, for instance, that of course feedback and uh, testing of all the tools and our services is welcome, so feel free to access them from the from the website, from the Fairs Fair website, we have the entry points to each of the tools and from there you can also find um, contact details and ways to contact us. Uh, we'll also provide a direct uh, indication of the teams uh, involved in the development to make it easier for you to get in touch with them. And uh, Jessica shared in the meantime some links uh, to the um, documents presenting the fair semantics activity. Thanks for that. We have a question from Inge asking a workshop specific, specifically on semantic operability would be interesting. So that's a very nice um, point and that we can take on as part of the different series of activities we're planning. So I'm sure Jessica, if you want to raise this, I maybe can say that we are also uh, organizing a series of national roadshows, I say in the uh, upcoming months to target specific communities. And uh, we might think of uh, uh, um, a webinar presenting, another one presenting, let's say, semantic out outputs and results from the project um, in, in the next months. So we'll take this as a suggestion. Uh, webinars were also organized in the past months and as well, the recordings are available online. So. Uh, we also invite you to double check whether any of them might be interesting for your activity. Any, any other questions or Jessica, if you want to add anything? Uh, well, yes, I could maybe comment that as I mentioned, we're doing, uh, especially on the fair semantics part, we're do, doing very close op uh, cooperation with the RDA. Oh, yeah. uh, group so there will be some some sessions in the RDA plenary and and also other workshops around these recommendations and the metadata for for semantic artifacts and then there's also the other work that's ongoing with the metadata 
uh, mapping and harvesting and catalog uh, pilot. So there's also probably <laughs> going to be some discussions around this. Uh, so those are our activities that are sort of already planned, but uh, I think it's a it's a good idea and and a more more like general discussion on on semantic interoperability like in in practice. Uh, it's certainly a very good idea. Thanks, Jessica. Thank um, and maybe yeah, it might be interesting to add the the sessions uh, where at the RDA plenary next week for those who are interested where. Uh, they can meet us. So um, I'll ask maybe Jessica to add a note in the chat and we'll, we can add this also in our uh, proceedings uh, and uh, post event message that will be sent to all of you. And we also have another comment from Susanna regarding interoperability in general. It would be good to see an example of how these data points link to the various cataloging work done by the other EOS project in the different disciplines. Very nice. Of course, feel free to open your microphone and if you want to um, intervene, Susanna, and, and this is a comment to all our, I know, <laughs> to all our speakers. She says she can't, but I think the question is very clear. Um, so again, Jessica, I don't know if you, or any of my other colleagues want to address the discipline aspects of uh, this work. Well, no, <laughs> it will be found in our, in our first landscape survey or a report that there are really big, huge differences, of course, between between domains, but also there are big, big differences between inside domains, and those are sometimes bigger than and between domains so yeah and if i may add maybe something it's uh, one of the um target that we have for the next months is to uh, work deeply with the discipline communities uh to understand needs and uh, uptake uh, in specific cases so again the idea of the national roadshow responds a little bit to this because we we aim to tackle specific needs from specific communities in a um, localized, let's say, uh, area, but also with a focus on as one specific or few specific communities. We have our champions, for instance, in the project, and some of them are here with us today, including Susanna, um, that represent, many of them represent specific disciplinary communities, so they can also be um, ambassadors, let's say, or um, channels to further exploit uh, the needs of different communities. Unless there is any other who wants to say something about this, maybe we can go to Jan's um, question. So is uh, again about semantic interoperability. One of the key step is to make sure semantic artifacts from the different communities are themselves fair. So again, we go back to the disciplinary differences. Jan, if you want to say something, uh, sure. feel free to intervene, yeah? It was more a comment than a question. Um, Think that if we want to achieve semantic interoperability across domain, the first thing we need to do is to harmonize the practices around semantic artifacts and make sure they are there themselves fair, because then you can build tools that will help with the semantic interoperability, such as mapping tools and, and things like that. And right now, in many, many different communities, it's not the case. Um, it's really hard to find ontologies. It's hard to find, to work with them. So that's why we have this uh, fair semantics recommendations that mm -hmm. attempt to do this. And we will organize several workshops around um, these principles, these recommendations, and we'll try now to ground them into practice to see how we can support the ontologies from the different communities to actually implement these recommendations. Thanks, Jan. And 
I would also raise the question by Keys. Um, so Keys, if you want to open your microphone, your question relates about, um, let's say, bringing in some concrete use cases, for instance, um, for fair digital objects. So I'm not sure if you can, if you can speak or if you can't, uh, I can read your question loud. Hi, this is Case. can you hear me? Yeah, great, thanks. Yeah, I went a, of a bit of a journey last year to figure this out because in EOSC, there is now a whole registry and there are a number of um, services for minting PIDs. But um, I have a few concrete projects. One is Eden, for instance, which is about uh, uh, real world healthcare data sets. So um, for instance, one study we did was uh, safety of hydroxychloroquine last year. And um, ideally, you would want to mint identifiers for some of the objects there, for instance, for a study, for the databases you used in the study. Um, and I was trying to figure out in EOS, you know, what is the service that I use for that? And I think on that very practical level, uh, it's still not clear. Jessica, please go go on if you want to. Yeah, reply. yeah. I think this is really, really an important <laughs> question, and and as I mentioned in my my talk, then uh, you, the PID always has to be there has to be metadata, and there has to be. <laughs> um, so uh, this is really, a, I think, um, yeah, we have the problems by, mainly of the like local implementations. And uh, as I mentioned, there's a lot of work like regarding the just policy and the architecture, the PIDs in, in the context uh, in this way, but then you still have to have the local implementations and you need to decide how you assign um, in the PIDs and how you manage and when you actually need an identifier or Gupri, as Jan likes to talk about them, those, or if you really want a PID with a resolver array and what kind of PID, and this is uh, really, really a, a difficult and interesting question. I'm, I'm, I'm sure, I, personally, I'm, I'm very interested in, in looking into this. On the other hand, when we made in the, the task 2.1, when we had collected feedback, uh, on our reports, the most questions came uh, on semantic interoperability, like more like metadata and this this level. So, so yeah, we will have to see how we can can tackle and approach this this question. But we're very open and interested in in continuing these discussions and hearing all all yeah. opinions. So I'm I'm happy to be a guinea pig. I think this is really you know where it all comes together. Mm -hmm. uh, I know all the theories about Gupri's and the services, and I can definitely understand how to do it myself, but that's not the point. The point is that we want to have it sustainable. Yeah. And ideally, as a free service in research, it's because what happened is, you know, I got an offer from Surf um, uh, for, let's say, a pay service for the PIDs, which is all fine. It's not a about money necessarily, but it's about, you know, how do we make this... Uh, um, a low barrier service in Europe. And for all the funding that, that goes into EOS, um, like if I from Eden, I decide, okay, let me pay your, let's say five year in advance to host this service. Um, I don't think that is a way that's gonna work um, just practically yeah. if, if we organize it like that. So I'm also looking now for alternatives, like maybe it's possible to uh, you know, use a completely different way, uh, such as anchoring um, comments in a blockchain. Uh, there, there are some interesting developments in, in that area that we could uh, use. But on the other hand, if EOS could just kind of get our act together and, and make a free service uh, very robust, similar to Zenodo, um, but then on a more fine-grained level, that could also work. Anyway, I, I don't want to take all of, of all of your time, but just pointing this out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I'm, I'm, thank you so much. I, I really think because uh, the point of the PID is also that it's promised, it's supposed to be trustworthy. So that means that even though it's cheap to mint <laughs> and allocate, they need curation for the system to work. So I think this is 
uh, one interesting dimension. But okay, let's <laughs> maybe leave the, the floor to others. Thank you. Thank you so much, Kies. Thank you. Thank you both. And, and maybe this is also the occasion to uh, say again that we are looking for, uh, let's say, in implementation stories, use cases. So feel free to get in touch with us to have uh, any of our tools or, uh, for instance, the recommendations or tested or uh, implemented in your environment. And since I see there are uh, members from the RDA community here also as well. So again, uh, bring all this there also to the nascent communities of practices there as to help us look in it more into a, a disciplinary aspect. So unless there is any other question, I think we can move to the second panel. Again, um, it will be moderated using a Mentimeter um, question this time Mustafa Mokran will be chairing it and I, I remember you uh, once more that the uh, the questions uh, are for, I mean, for the panel while you will also be invited to answer them but also feel free to raise any other question you might have for our panelists. Mustafa. Thank you Sarah. Um, yeah, so it's time now for our second panel. Um, my name is Mustafa McRain. I work at Dance. Um, I'm also um, co-project lead for Fair's Fair. So let's gather our panelists. Um, I invite uh, our four panelists to switch on their videos if, if they can, of course. Uh, Isabel Bernard, Itu Michaela, David Carr, and Inge van Uverberg. I don't see it your cameras or the settings. Oh no, actually you are on, I just need to adjust my screen here. Okay. So uh, let me start by introducing our panelists to the audience. So first we have um, Isabel Bernal. Isabel Bernal manages the Digital CSIC, the multidisciplinary repository of the Spanish National Research Council. She participates in the EOSC Synergy um, project on fair and training related activities. Isabel is also um, a valued member of our European group of fair champions. Thank you, Isabel, for joining this panel. Our second panelist, Itu Makela. Itu is um, an associate professor in human sciences computing interactions at the University of Helsinki, where he leads a research group that studies how to support data centric research in the humanities and social sciences. Itu was previously a linked data researcher, and he brings also to our European group of fair champions his unique perspective on fair requirements and solutions. Our third panelist, David Carr. He is Program Manager for Open Research at the Wellcome Trust. David has been working over the last years to develop Fairware, a cross-funder project to design and develop tools that will help support and embed the uptake of the FAIR principles. First FAIR has an MOU with the Fairware project, so we're very happy about that. And David is also an esteemed member of our high-level advisory committee. Thanks, David, for joining this panel. And last but not least, Inge von Neuverberg. Um, Inge is coordinator scholarly communication at Ghent University. Uh, open science has been at the core of her activities for years, not only within Ghent University, but also in other projects like Open Air, EOSC Pillar, and international groups like the EUA Expert Group on Open Science. So thanks um, very much to our four panelists to having agreed to, to join us uh, for this discussion. We have a number of questions and um, the first one is already on the screen. And as uh, Sarah just uh, reminded, uh, reminded the audience, you're welcome to uh, add your responses to try and uh, also animate the discussion with, with the panelists. So please, uh, our four panelists, if you can also have a look at those, uh, at those uh, responses coming from the audience and maybe take some of these into your uh, thinking, it would be great. So the first question to get us started, um, and we've learned al already a lot about uh, the various uh, 
disciplinary um, um, differences that exist across communities and also the various projects that exist um, in, in this FAIR uh, landscape and um, FAIR and EOSC environment. So the first FAIR project um, to try and address this um, issue uh, includes um, a significant effort through um, its synchronization force, for example, to help coordinate and align with the various projects on FAIR related issues. And as part of our panelists, we have members involved also in other projects. So in your perspective, how best to avoid duplication <laughs> of efforts, in particular in the European context and in the EOS context, in, including across projects? So this is the, the first question. And I would like to invite maybe Isabel to get us started. Um, what is your perspective on this issue? Um, hello, everybody. Um, thank you for, for inviting me. Um, I think that um, quite a lot of uh, duplication is unintended um, in the sense that there is a relative lack of awareness of what other communities are doing. So I think that it's, it's really key to, to, to enable more um, channels for all these different communities and stakeholders to uh, to share their work and also to to find uh, synergies. Um, in this regard, um, I would I would like to mention the the European initiative um, Join Up uh, that is being developed by the um, uh, European Commission uh, team um, promoting um, interoperability in the public sector. And, and I think it's a nice example of how to bring together in a portal uh, different solutions that are going to promote uh, interoperability. Uh, so I, 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 for me, it's a nice example because for all the research um, performing organizations that are public and therefore are going to be also um, affected by the new public sector information directive, um, I, I, I want to, to, to emphasize that research data is now part of the public sector information and directive. We will have to uh, consider um, recommendations for the public sector, but at the same time, we have to consider recommendations uh, to participate in EOSC. So also we could, I don't know, um, promote um, more synergy between the two um, initiatives. Thank you, Isabel, for bringing up this uh, th this initiative and the, and the need also to consider research data in the broader context of uh, publicly f uh, generated information, I, I suppose, and, and, and resources. Um, this is uh, quite interesting. Um, Inge, maybe you could share with us your, your perspective in, in this context? Yeah, sure. I already see a lot of comments there from Mentimeter that Quite, are quite aligned with what I was going to say. Um, uh, now I have been in different European uh, projects throughout the years. And so I have seen many results coming out of projects and sometimes results just hanging there and not, not being used afterwards. And that's such a pity because there's a lot of uh, information out there, a lot of interesting stuff going on in the projects. Now to avoid duplication, and I would put it even differently, to make sure that there is some interaction and cooperation uh, between projects and uh, I would not only say project, but also organizations working on this uh, together, there are different things to take into consideration. Of course, when I'm talking about projects, you start already at proposal stage. And um, when we look at the EOSC Association and the partnership with the European Commission, there is really an opportunity there through the work program to have really targeted uh, projects with uh, good collaboration between them uh, to, to deliver something that is useful for, for more than one community. So uh, that is a first step. Of course, you have to avoid not to, um, avoid that innovation or new ideas cannot come up there so that there is room for that that you don't block this but a first step would be this uh, and secondly initiatives uh, such as RDA, RDA uh, open air um, uh, university associations like EUA play a crucial role 
as a communication and hubs where connection between projects and between uh, organizations uh, can be uh, can be fostered and can, can be uh, can work together. So discussion, communication, and uh, dissemination of results is, is so important. And then to see with people that maybe are outside of the, these projects, to see where you can find connections and put them together, uh, that would be great as well. Um, and then there are, uh, during the project phase, we see already here with the EOS projects that there are task forces working together across uh, projects and to align what is happening in the different projects. I find that uh, very inspiring and, and very interesting to, to see that happen. Um, and then if uh, outcomes uh, are taken up by uh, communities like RDA, that, 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 is, that will be great. Uh, I myself uh, am a bit involved in the Infra EOS 5 B project task force on training. So it's, it's nice to see uh, what happens in the different projects and, and which lessons learned we can, we can take on together. And of course, at the end of projects, some, some results are not satisfactory and okay, they have to disappear, but we have to keep track of the lessons learned there. And then on the other hand, you have very successful tools, which are very interesting to, uh, to use in, in different communities. And so then they have to be disseminated within different communities. And that is a difficult one uh, sometimes uh, to go to the disciplines themselves. So there, it, it all revolves around communication and collaboration and talking and keeping track of each other's work. Uh, which is not always easy and it takes a lot of effort and time actually, uh, we have to be honest about that, but it, it's quite crucial. And I wanted to, to, to at la the, as last thing, uh, say a few things about uh, Belgium. From the beginning in 2019, uh, with, uh, we, we, for EOSC, we really tried to get engaged with different partners, Belgian partners uh, in European uh, EOSC projects to work together and to align. I don't say it always works and it's always easy, but we try to, to keep track of each other's results and, and, and keep each other updated. And on the other hand, we try for Belgian projects, so funded by Belgian funders, to integrate uh, results, for example, from First Fair, from Open Air, to integrate them in, in our own projects. And we are working now on a project called Fair GNSS, where we are trying, uh, we use, for example, uh, the tool, and now I forgot the name, the Fair Aware tool, to see how we can uh, set up repositories that are in, well, that use the, the Fair principles and how to, to make sure that the community can take that up. So it's, it's a combination of things, but it's, basically a lot of communication and a, a, it takes some time and effort. Thanks Inga, I think you've touched on, on, touched on very important points. So um, I, I take it that it is difficult, but we need sometimes that diversity and it's not always um, something that we can easily convey to, 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 to the specific community. So that's very good uh, to, to, to hear. Um, I'll ask maybe Itu to provide us with his perspective on, on this question. Itu? Yeah, so, so mine is sort of an outsider's perspective as a researcher. Uh, I, I think looking at the Mentimeter results, um, a certain amount of duplication is unavoidable in things of this scale. And when you take that into account, I actually feel that the sort of um, communication in, in sort of fair uh, principles and, and standards has been very good at the sort of uh, sharing of best practices and, and unified solutions is, is actually seems to be working really well on that level, on the level of things that can be centrally managed and shared, um, then when you start to get into the sort of disciplines and, and uh, researchers' knowledge of, of what is fair and, and why they should be interested, then that's a whole different question. But I actually have a um, strong opinion that that uh, this is a matter that the disciplines themselves need to sort of pick up and that you cannot bring into them 
from the outside. And on the level of sort of awareness of that fair is important, uh, that at least in Finland seems to be now sort of uh, coming very nicely from the sort of centralized administrative uh, academic funder agencies and so on. So the awareness is there. And then what's left is that, uh, and the centralized services are sort of there. Uh, what's left is that the disciplines need to figure out the rest. Thanks, um, Itu. That's that's very clear. And I, I like the comment in the chat that researchers are not outsiders. You're completely part of the of the family. So. Um, finally, David, um, any views on, on this? Uh uh, yeah, I mean, those were those were excellent answers. I'll be very brief because I don't have um, a lot to add, and I think the points I was I, I was going to raise are covered. I mean, I'd say, uh, as someone who's been actively trying to develop an initiative in the fair data space, um, keeping on track of everything, uh, on top of everything that's happening, is an uh, is a really enormous challenge, um, and there's a real need, I think, to bring things uh, uh, to bring things together. Uh, but as has been said, I think some duplication is. Um, uh, is is kind of uh, unavoidable and 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 maybe desirable, um, but not unnecessary duplication. Um, I just um, I think the points I had down, I think many of which are in the in the points. I think it's important to work in an open, collaborative, uh, consultative, and also flexible way in terms of how you take these things things forward and be um, and be open to joining up and collaborating, and also um, uh, also um, very responsive to the. Uh, 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 to the needs of uh, to the needs of users and the broader research community, um, and I completely agree. Active communication and dissemination is um, is 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 really crucially uh, is is really crucially uh, important. I think, speaking from a funder perspective, that perhaps um, kind of uh, visibility uh, there's a way to go in terms of sort of increasing the sort of the visibility of the the, the kind of the great work that um, Fairs Fair and others have. Um, uh, has have done the importance of fair and um and uh, yeah i mean i think that could be a, a an area where sort of further so some further work would be um would be desirable i think there's a i think there's a, the beginnings of a real sort of um appreciation amongst funders of the of the importance of this but really um making sure that they're aware of where things things are at and are actively considerate in terms of the activities they're supporting um i i think so i think it's a remaining challenge so i'll, I'll stop there thanks Thanks, David. These are really excellent perspectives coming from really different um, angles as well. So this is really good. Um, in the interest of time, let's move to the next question because we're slightly running out of time. So the second question is actually linked to the semantic interoperability frameworks that were discussed by Jessica. Um, we see this in Fair's Fair really as the next big challenge identified to enable fair beyond the current focus on findability and accessibility. So do you know of any models or good examples, maybe within your community or related to your work, which could help us make progress regarding this, the governance of the semantic interoperability frameworks? How can we achieve this? And who wants to start with this? Maybe Itu? Um, I'm gonna be controversial and unpopular here in that I don't think uh, trying to enable semantic interoperability across disciplinary boundaries is actually uh, useful or makes sense. And further, I think that sort of the disciplines where it sort of within disciplinary interoperability makes sense, they usually already have figured this out. So you have sort of European social survey uh, has standardized uh, European social statistics uh, to be sort of comparable across uh, nations in Europe. And on the other hand, in, for example, bioinformatics, you have standards for proteins and, and um, nucleic acid. Uh, and DNA, DNA sequences, but I, I find that um, that that's that's the level that I I think this is useful, and I think where it's useful, the disciplines themselves have actually already seen that, and that it's um, sort of coming up with use cases where combining data interoperability across disciplines. Um, is hard and that's what you should do first before trying to accomplish the interoperability. Yeah. 
Thanks, Ito. I think this is actually not so controversial because going back to the metaphor of raising the bar over time, I think starting to um, address this question within the disciplines is addressing the semantic interoperability within the disciplines is clearly the first step. I think what you're asking here maybe is, do we need to go that additional step towards uh, across, uh, across disciplines? So I'll ask the other panelists, what are their views on this? Um, maybe I'll start with Isabel again. Yeah. Um, so I think that, um, I mean, I, I agree with comments I'm reading now. Uh, there are a lot of research communities that are doing a lot of work uh, to, to achieve interoperability within. But I think the challenge is, you know, to, to, to achieve interoperability with the other uh, research communities. I think that um, a nice example that is recent is all the work done by the uh, Earth Sciences um, community. They released very um, few months ago um, a metadata model to describe uh, geosamples, but they are making efforts to reach out to other research communities. So this could be an interdisciplinary um, effort. Um, but what is maybe uh, missing is, is consolidated and, and very well known um, examples to reach interoperability across all the disciplines. Of course, there are um, examples. Uh, but maybe not completely mm, well known by, by everybody. Um, Jessica mentioned uh, DCAT um, uh, profile. Uh, also, mm, for instance, like the Research Data Australia community did a lot of work to promote a format so that all the data providers in Australia um, exchange their data in a, in, in a similar um, uh, metadata with common uh, concepts. Uh, and then uh, there's a lot of work being done by the agnostic uh, schemas. Um, so I think that um, now talking with my heart of um, data site metadata uh, working group, um, by the way, we released the new version last week, um, but there is a growing effort to promote the usage of um, PID based uh, properties within the schema and also the promotion of controlled vocabularies uh, to promote more interoperability across um, all disciplines. So, um, of course, a lot of more work can be done, but um, mm -hmm. some communities are really active. Thanks, Isabel, for highlighting those examples of uh, uh, initiatives uh, that are advancing in, the, in this field. Uh, David, do you have any examples, um, maybe in the biomedical field, that you are aware of? Oh, um, sorry, I, I, I don't. I'm afraid my knowledge of semantic interoperability uh, or degree of technical understanding isn't isn't enough that I feel sort of qualified to really offer an, uh, an, an opinion on this. I suppose at a higher level, um, from a funder perspective, I think we're acutely aware different communities are at very different places. Um, uh, and, um, uh, and I think the point I wanted to, to kind of make on this one is more like a, um, that as a funder, we're definitely very... Um, open to, to hearing how we can best play a role in terms of um, uh, helping on this. So certainly um, I think funders can play a role in terms of uh, sparking those discussions in different communities and bringing um, key folks within communities and across communities um, together. And also I think funders have a key role in terms of sort of um, uh, uh, thinking about how best to support the key sort of infrastructures and services needed to enable this. So sorry, I'm not answering the question. Yeah, you sure. asked, but, but, <laughs> but, but you're, but you're okay. saying funders have a role to play, which is good. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Thanks. Inga, maybe quickly also, if you can uh, say yeah, something. Very, very quickly. I just talked to the, about this with my colleague and uh, she, she reminded me mm. that there is a group within the RDA where um, a common standard around DMPs is developed. But so when you talk about governance, this might be as a, on the governance, not uh, that it should be uh, a, a nice um, example to, that you can use. And another example that you could use, but I'm not completely sure that it's appropriate uh, or it's a right one, sorry, uh, is the Flemish research information space where we, Flemish universities and the research organizations work together to exchange metadata with semantic um, 
uh, with semantic interoperability and we implement a framework on how we exchange this information. But this is of course not only on data, this is, well, data is, still has to come. It's on uh, disciplines, it's on researchers, it's on, it, it's on publications, but maybe on the governance side of things, this, this can help. Just want to say that even on that level, it's not easy to do. And uh, it's, it's a tough case. And that's what I also see in the comments here in the Mentimeter. Um, th these data getting it together, it, it's difficult. And in EOS yeah. Pillar, we have a, a work package in which we work on ontologies and interoperability of ontologies. And I just want to make a plea, if you have something to say about this, if you want to work together with us, uh, just give me a sign. Thanks, Inge. And noted also for the additional comment from E2A in, in, in the chat, I think you've clarified your, your, your viewpoint there, that in, across disciplines, we need to have really use cases to uh, support that. Very good. Um, we have only five minutes left and one more question, which might open also a lot of discussion. So let's move on to the next, the final question. And I'll ask the panelists maybe to, to keep their answers brief if possible. So another key challenge to enable fair data and integration across disciplines is to find the right balance between preserving the disciplinary richness, for example, in, in the metadata and also enabling solutions for cross-disciplinary met metadata integration. So in your opinion, what is the right balance between keeping that disciplinary richness and also enabling an, a, a cross-disciplinary metadata integration? Uh, so please, short answers. Um, I'll, yeah, I know that's not going to be easy, but if you can keep them short. So let's start with David. I uh, put you on the, again on the spot. Uh, yeah, very briefly. I'm not sure this is quite getting at what the the question is asking, but certainly that the question of sort of um, disciplinary depth versus um, kind of broad applicability is something that we're actively thinking about. That is one of the really um, sort of key issues that we're thinking about in terms of developing uh, the Fairway project across uh, across funders, particularly as we have a mix of different types of funders involved, some uh, who are, uh, are more biomedical health focused and some who have a very broad disciplinary uh, reach uh, and the I guess the approach where uh, we're trying to take at least is to build something with uh, or to try to sort of um, develop something with with broad applicability with a core that kind of um, and a common approach that works across um, disciplines but but also develop something that's highly extensible in terms of um, uh, allowing communities to, uh, to to sort of adapt and build on it to meet their uh, to be their own needs. I have no idea if we'll be successful in doing that, but that's uh, but that's kind of our uh, our thinking in terms of taking forward the, the project uh, we're developing. Thanks, David. Um, I don't see many answers coming in the Menti, but please keep thinking about it. <laughs> Isabel. <laughs> yeah, uh, I mean, this is the question. Um, the right balance, I think it's, it's a bit subjective, but I think what I would say is that the goal would be to promote um, the most, the richest metadata possible in the, um, in within the frontiers of every single research community, but then promoting semantic mapping and semantic linking at a higher le uh, layer. Because what we are trying to do here with the semantic interoperability is that researchers from other communities find and discover uh, relevant and interesting data coming from other research uh, communities. I think this is really the challenge. So um, here what we need is like um, the promotion of um, maybe multilingual uh, vocabularies, multilingual mm -hmm. uh, linkage, open data ontologies, uh, and also more um, raising more awareness amongst uh, researchers because this whole metadata terminology and all these phrases are very difficult to, to understand. I would like to, to just close and uh, giving an example. I think um, Europeana did a great work uh, to show to data providers that uh, depending on the richness of their metadata, the potential users were going to be able to do more or less things. So this is the kind of message that I think we should be um, sending through more clearly in EOSC. Um, not talking so much about metadata per se, but what can people do if the metadata are more or less rich? 
Thanks, Isabel. I, I get that your answer is we need to keep both. So we need to keep the disciplinary richness and have the more abstract um, interoperability yeah. or cross-disciplinary uh, integration. E2, um, any views yeah. on this I'm, point? I'm, I'm disciplinary richness all the way, um, <laughs> but I also think that there's, there's a sort of a solution to this, which is that uh, I don't think the sort of integration uh, should happen on the level of data. Instead, I, I suggest that data should be recorded in its uh, disciplinary richness, and then uh, you, could, you should provide mapping programs uh, on a use case basis where uh, data is mapped from these disciplinary formats to uh, a common sort of uh, format for that use case. So that way you don't have to sort of at the point of entering in data, you don't need to make this choice of, of, of removing the richness. And you are sort of moving the task of, of um, sort of unifying the data from this general infrastructure to the uh, use case community, which may sort of, uh, many people may have that need, but the commonality will be then in the use case. Thanks, Itu. I think this is also a very clear um, response and you're insisting on the use case to, to justify those uh, mappings. So that's very good. Final words, uh, um, final word I would give to Inge. <laughs> Use cases definitely are an answer to several of the questions that we had here, also on semantic interoperability. So I completely agree with that. Just one other thing I wanted to say, it's always a trade-off between discoverability and effort. Uh, because a researcher, like Ito probably also mentioned, um, researchers want to put in, in effort when they see uh, the benefits and when they know that it will really be good uh, for the community to make data discoverable but they are less inclined to do so if they don't see that benefit and then it's a more a generic thing. So it's always a trade-off between the discoverability of the data and the effort that is uh, being put in there. So I do agree with uh, especially what Isabel also said, um, you need both, but uh, you need to make sure that the researcher still has the precise, uh, very uh, specific um, things for his, his or her domain, and that we can have cross-domain uh, generic, uh, yeah, the generic effort, but I'll keep it to that. Thank you very much for uh, the panelists. Please give your virtual applauses to our panelists. That was really a very, very interesting discussion. And um, we will make sure we will di dig deeper into the responses we received in the Menti. So thanks everyone. And I hand it over back to you, Sarah, with a couple of minutes uh, delay. Sorry about that. Uh, no, thank you, Mustafa, and thank you, everybody. Really interesting discussions. It's a pity we need to stop. You might know that this workshop is part of an intense week of meetings, so I might just remind you that on Thursday, the 15th, there will be another public event dedicated to present the outcomes of the FAIR repository support program. It will start at 10, so you, you have the details to connect on the same message that you received with the registration link for today and you can find it on our website so you're all welcome there and uh, with that I think we can close the workshop I really thank uh, very much all our speakers all our panelists and most of all all of you who attended, be, be, be our ambassadors outside to your communities and get back to us uh, with any suggestion or question. Thank you very much and enjoy the rest of the day.